name is Rahul Mehrotra. I'm here with my colleague Saurav Bishwas. Uh, and uh, we are going to talk to you about uh, our installation at the Venice Biennale called Becoming Urban. Uh, it's a very interesting background. Our relationship and work on this project goes back, well, many years, uh, and it'll soon be close to a decade, uh, where Saurav was a student at the Graduate School of Design. I am a professor at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University, and we began collaborating on trying to understand uh, what is emerging as patterns of urbanization in India, and uh, Saurav's uh, incredible uh, skills at um, looking at big data uh, beginning to discern patterns, uh, uh, you know, added a fantastic dimension to this project. So this is a deeply collaborative project, uh, one that has morphed from our relationship as professor and student to being more than equal colleagues. Uh, and uh, finally uh, resulted in um, actually a project to do a book called Becoming Urban, which we hope to have out by the end of the year, early next year. Uh, and uh, in the meantime came the Venice Biennale. So what we did was we translated the findings of the book, which we thought fitted the theme of the Biennale incredibly well, uh, because India is an extreme in terms of um, the kinds of patterns of urbanizations and the new typologies of urbanization that are emerging. And so the exhibition is called Becoming Urban, because the underlying thesis of the project is that India is in the process of becoming urban. It's an incomplete process and one that's ongoing. Uh, and so that really is the background of the project. I continue to work as an architect in Mumbai and also teach at the Graduate School of Design. And I'm going to hand it over to Saurav for a brief introduction and background of his interest. Saurav Biswas, I was a landscape architecture student at the GSD when Rahul and I started working together. Uh, a lot of the research has been informed also by our interaction with Neil Brenner, who was the urban planning professor at GSD at the same time. So we were kind of pushing to look beyond the traditional cities or the places that we consider cities as the lens to which we try to understand the issues of urbanization. And especially in India, it turned out that lens to be immensely productive because of the kind of transformations that are taking place. And we were able to, at a very high level, uh, summarize some of those transitions using different kinds of proxies and using a lot of reference literature that sociologists and economists are writing about in India to build a narrative of some of the blind spots that we have by focusing on what we consider the urban using census metrics and what it what a what a planning challenge it represents to really think about urbanization and its impact on small towns, but also villages that are urbanizing and also the peri-urban areas outside our big cities. The first question I had was, of course, with you know, the starting point with I uh, think post-independent or maybe just 20th century architecture, which is Corbusier, he's quite a uh, anchor. There are other installations actually at the Venice Biennale, which either challenge uh, Corbusier's uh, ideas or uh, there are quite a few references to that. So if you all could talk to us a little bit about Chandigarh and how that becomes a starting point, uh, it's, I think especially in the video, it's a starting point uh, where the video then begins from. So if you all could elaborate on that a little bit. So, you know, I mean, Chandigarh is an obvious emblematic starting point because it symbolizes the start of uh, uh, the, the nation in its present formulation. Uh, it also is emblematic of the modernist project, which uh, in many ways is about absolutism in terms of an absolute solution, a superimposed grid. Uh, and also it's emblematic uh, really, and which is what uh, the film in the installation brings about. It's emblematic of the aberrations that also occur within that absolutism, right? Uh, where we zoom into uh, a, a village that got kind of encompassed in the in the grid, which is, and, and that juxtaposed between absolutism and these more self-initiated organic kinds of solutions is really what is, uh, if you think about it, the state of the Indian city, correct? It's, it's that conflict that we are trying to resolve. And so for these reasons, Chandigarh was, uh, you know, it was an obvious starting point uh, because it showed the braveness of trying to create a new world with Nehru and Corbusier and, uh, and the idea of Nehru kind of constructing an Indian identity through the urban project, right? Uh, and also, I think we believe that uh, that yet perpetuates almost 70 plus years later, 
uh, and that conflict is yet an unresolved one. And therefore, again, in the title, becoming the verb, the process, uh, is it's an ongoing project. It's not a static, absolute solution. And to us, Chandigarh just represented uh, very starkly the the closeness, but also the disparity between a very planned city and the kind of non-planned villages that exist within quite spatially and thematically Chandigarh wasn't the first planned city of India, but it was one of the most important planning projects in a post-independent India that tried to encapsulate what India should be as a primarily agrarian rural nation to Nehru's ambition of being an industrialized urban nation. And we think that legacy still stands so strongly in this idea of how the future urban population will live in India. There's this discourse on India will become more urban than rural by 2050. But our question starts with what exactly are these settlements going to be like? And are they going to be like more future Chandigars, or are they going to be more like the urban villages that have partially been ignored by the discourse on how Chandigarh was planned? The villages pre-existed the grid, and the villages continue to evolve and grow within that grid in very interesting ways. And so our hypothesis is almost that by looking at these two conditions where will the future urban population live? Is it going to be more closely resembling the villages of Burel or the Lal Lora villages of Delhi or the informal settlements of Mumbai? Or are they going to represent more living within greenfield cities that are planned like Chandigarh? And we think it may not be the case, but we actually don't have a way of addressing what it means for people to urbanize in places like those villages. More pointedly, just to, to, to extend, expand or to stretch what uh, Saurav has put on the plate, is also it, the, the underlying and implicit question for the profession there is the instrumentality and the agency of architecture itself, right? Uh, so therefore, in the making of cities, what is the role? We assume architecture is the most instrumental uh, way of uh, creating these places, right? It might not be, it might be infrastructure, it might be other ways of creating negotiations and agreements between people. Uh, so there's a lot to learn from both ends of the spectrum uh, of this duality, as you might sort of call it. That's, that's true. I mean, it's, it's, it's architecture versus just an infrastructure development. But uh, tell me, is there any correlation between what we got from Kabuzi and Chandigarh, which is horizontal living, while today the entire cityscape is going vertical. So is there any correlation between the living of horizontal versus vertical? Well, you know, uh, I think uh, Amit, their context matters. And I think uh, you could argue uh, that, um, uh, again, uh, I, I think what, what Chandigarh is emblematic is a kind of universal approach to make cities, right? Which then permeated our systems of governance and policy and things like that. And I mean, I think that too, context really matters, geography really matters, uh, and there is no final solution. So, I mean, a story I always tell is, uh, you know, I grew up and studied architecture, reading only criticism about Chandigarh. I read fantastic things about the buildings in Chandigarh. Everyone was moved by them. But as a city plan, it was only criticized, right? Uh, and, uh, and one went there, you know, uh, in the first year or something that I was studying and one didn't have the judgment to think about it, but one realized that, you know, it was terribly hot, those roads to see people biking on them. There were, you know, these big avenues and, you know, it was just seemed like non-urban. You know, two years or three years ago, I went to Chandigarh for some reason, three times in the year. And I was mind blown because it was, it, it felt like a dream city, really, because those avenues now had fantastic trees. There were people picnicking there. People were now driving their bikes in shaded parks. Um, it had a whole green system. We talk about, you know, we, if we apply the parameters of sustainability, I'm using that broad, very, you know, sometimes unproductive word. But if we had to talk about managing water systems, if we had to talk about managing food production, I mean, Chandigarh has a kind of implicit infrastructure uh, that it can reinvent itself uh, in, in tremendous ways. So, you know, the thing about cities also is the temporal dimension, right? Uh, cities, unlike buildings, don't occur, uh, you know, overnight. Uh, cities takes hundreds of years. 
uh, to evolve, which means they sometimes change purpose, they readapt themselves. So then the question really becomes, uh, is a city with high rise, high density, a brittle urban form? And is cities with low rise, low density or medium density, a much more robust form, which means that it has greater capacity to readapt. Yeah? So it depends on how you frame it and what temporal scale you frame it, right? The, the critique of that urbanism that we are offering is, uh, who did we provide the tools to build within that armature? And did we over-regulate around the armature so much that only very specific stakeholders could actually build and grow upon it? So Chandigarh, as an example, just planned a lot for their government employees. There were sector-based plans. So they built the houses for people who were planned to live there, but not for the people who came to build the city. And so even inevitably you did have informal settlements. You also see urban villages developing a commercial complexity that the places zoned as commercial in Chandigarh do not have. So you will find amenities and things within the urban villages that you don't find in Chandigarh's commercial centers. And at that point is where we are making the case for how much did we you know, over plan or how much do we have an imaginary of planning that excludes a different way of city building, where again, if you're talking about high rises, we are preparing the armature for private developers to come in and build a high rise. But most of India lives within self-built low rise, two to three stories built with brick concrete. Um, and do we actually provide armatures for that typology to grow, uh, not just informally, but also in a planned manner? Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. So you know, to build on that, Amit, and to go back to your question, to revisit your question now that Saurav has added that, and to put it in a very simple way, and that's why the question of the instrumentality of architecture is very critical, is that if you assume that different components of a city have different life cycles, uh, then the question becomes, which one do you privilege? Actually, architecture has the smallest life cycle in the construction of a city, and we often privilege that as the organizing instrument, right? And this is, I think, the key question uh, that has been a very big learning for us just observing what's happening in India. Especially when you hear, when India or say the global south or the global east even is discussed, you do very often, even in architecture and in infrastructure and these different co components that make up cities, you the conversation tends to have a duality to it. How does that duality become such a, um, evident or such a strong part of the conversation uh, if, if, this, if this research helped reveal something about that. The dissolution of these binaries become very clear in the work we have done, right? So having said that, to go back to your, the fundamentals of your question, why do binaries occur? Binaries are useful ways for us to organize complex problems, right? I mean, you, you see the rich and you see the poor and you realize that the way they make the city, the way they relate to the city is different. So you say the city of the rich and the poor, you say the temporary city and the permanent city. So the dualities are a great way uh, to organize the world around us generally. And you can extend the, 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 these binary um, uh, organizations of our understanding of the patterns that surround us into many, many disciplines, right? You can go into anthropology and people are divided by literary and oral traditions. You know, you can go into all sorts of disciplines and you find the binaries there, correct? Now, I think what differentiates design and by extension planning, urban design, architecture, landscape architecture, all of that is design inherently is about synthesis. Design is inherently about seeing how you can dissolve those binaries, not reinforce the binaries. Because what ha one has to accept is the binaries is the first step in understanding the world. But the binary also manifests the problem, which is by creating the duality, you create divided worlds, you create polarization, you create injustice, you create inequity, you create violence, you create all sorts of problems, which you can see surrounding politics around the world, right? And I think the big uh, responsibility of design is to imagine ways well, especially through spatial organization, uh, sort of use the word armature, how do you construct armatures within which there can be the dissolution of these binaries? Because finally, we want to live together. We want to live as one world. Uh, we want to uh, you know, dissolve the binaries, not reinforce them. But conversely, I'm sorry, I'm talking too much, but this is an important point. But what really happens in the profession is people 
take alliance to one of the other worlds you know so you have architects who are only working with the poor who are talking about human right i mean housing rights who are trying to do upgrading of slums and they don't want to talk to a developer they see everyone else as ugly and then you have architects who only work in the other world and don't want to deal with the problems of the poor the problems of the settlements that sort of was de- uh, defining but you can't avoid it because by doing that by default the profession will also reinforce the binaries and i think the biggest challenge for us as a profession going forward uh, is to take on the responsibility of dissolving these binaries and a first step towards taking on that responsibility is understanding how this could happen and i think therefore it's not black and white it's not this or that but it's also the gray scales in between the nuances which is i think what this research is premised on which is what sort of very beautifully articulated at the beginning of the conversation is how does one look at all those other forms and learn from them yeah and in, and in our book we do start with the number of binaries as a starting point but slowly start to deconstruct them to find more productive ways to engage what the real ground conditions are so we do start with urban rural but obviously we also have to contest with what is considered formal and informal and planned uh non planned and and the reality is everything is planned to a certain extent that there are institutional plans and then there are household plans and informal settlements are a result of you could say spontaneous plans of people reacting to what they can strategically do to have a foothold and then you have another network of players um that benefit from that ecosystem a lot of the growth that's fueling india today are typologies like uh, tenement housing for low wage workers on the peripheries but it is part of a network of informal private developers who are working outside the the planned regimen and the the point of these conditions is that planning or the way we consider statutory planning never happens in a tabula rasa basis it is a, an imaginary that has been perpetuated by a simplified view of chandigarh we see it perpetuated in any imagination of the smart cities or the industrial cities like dholera or many other places that planning can happen in a tabula rasa but planning always has to engage uh, settlements or neighborhoods that came up through different modes of planning i would still say um and yeah. we have to kind of negotiate the fact that we have to work with these different modes of city building some of which we call informal but they do have a network of actors working in a certain way that actually makes sense for that level uh and what we found by negotiating or interrogating these binaries is that we actually don't have the toolkits in planning to negotiate that which means as a city expands into what has always been a network of villages um or as a city grows and you already have urban villages within it uh we don't have very many good case studies of how those get integrated and that's actually the most important challenge going forward it's that we might be retrofitting informal settlements but we also have to deal with existing villages that are now going to be absorbed within the cities or we really need a typology where low income households can keep building the city otherwise we will just keep perpetuating this binary of planned and non planned in a way that doesn't really allow both to to thrive in the city with respect to the present scenario of uh... the practice of the profession in india itself okay uh, i think we have struggled with this uh, notion of indianness in architecture for for a lot of years especially post independence so what what do you exactly think uh, is the role of modern architectural practice in this context uh, you know in order to sort of bridge this or or to accelerate this uh, gradual transformation that you're talking about towards the urban or the urban as you visualize it through your research i mean i think uh, they, here and uh, so you know i think our at independence clearly nehru took the stance of embracing modernism and he did it for a social agenda but he also did it raj- largely because he was constructing the notion of the identity of pan indian identity right one that cut across all the incredible diversity and pluralism and what modernism did sans its decoration sans its symbolic references uh, its functionality 
uh, and its social agenda, which I think he understood uh, in the way it could be used for mass production, housing, that it became tied with the identity of modern India, correct? Uh, and uh, that kind of persisted as an official project, although there were many aberrations. The Vidhan Sada in Bangalore was being built in parallel to Chandigarh. So it was not like everyone fell in line and embraced modernism. There were deviations that occurred. But the official line, whether it was the public works department, et cetera, was modernism became, and it was you know, rational for many reasons. It was easy to write tender documents. It was easy to reproduce and replicate. It was easy to specify. But what it led to was a universalizing solution. So the way this relates to our research is the emblem of Chandigarh that we use and the way that infiltrates the imagination, not only in terms of urban planning, but also in terms of the architectural imagination, right? So that's what happened in modernism. Then wind forward to the emergency. For us, the emergency was a, uh, uh, a moment where I think India, uh, the the brave new world suddenly crumbled, right? Uh, in the emergency, India realized, I'm not even talking about the politics of institutional uh, breaking and all, I'm just talking about the fact that everyone realized that uh, there was another country that existed, which was splintered by caste, religion, uh, it was splintered by economic differences. There was poverty. There's no coincidence that right after the emergency, all the uh, kinds of NGOs that we celebrate today all emerged in the 70s and 80s because people realized that was what we needed to grapple with, right? Slum discussions about slum, upgradation, Kirti Shaf, Asa, Sheila Patel from Spark. I mean, name anyone you name who works in that sector all grew out of that turmoil, right? Because civil society got a big jolt and it also allowed civil society to reorganize itself, correct? So I think we are at we are actually at a very important moment where uh, we, if we create this intersection between these new imaginaries of planning, um, architecture is set to then respond because architecture has broken away from the edifice of the absolute solution. And everyone's realized that Laurie Baker came out of the post-emergency. So see, anyone who worked with that kind of uh, uh, anti, not let's say not anti-modern, but kind of an alternate imagination all came out of that pivotal moment. Liberalization did something else and began to draw us back into our absolute solutions because uh, liberalization brought a new imagination of the city, which was, I think, what um, Amit was alluding to earlier, where we were trying to make everything like Shanghai and Dubai. Right. So that's also a form of absolutism, which, thanks to the pandemic, thanks to our terrible economic conditions, has also demolished itself. Correct. Uh, so the, the I think, uh, you know, I think and this is really the important thing about our research is what we are trying hard to do, which is what I think sort of articulated just a moment ago, was how do you bring these new imaginations also to the city, to planning, to urban design? Uh, then you begin to have a synergy. You know? we, uh, they, this disjuncture between architecture and urban planning is enormous in India. In fact, it's, it's probably the biggest in our country or in our region uh, than anywhere else in the world. And I think that, that bridge, that binary, uh, Devanshi, if you also call that a binary, a binary of scales, is one that we really need to bridge. And we hope that this research begins to expose an audience of students and academics and practitioners to being confident or being seeing more clearly different imaginations that could occur uh, also at that scale yeah I, I think it's what you said rahul is is unfortunately so true um and i use the word unfortunately because the whole um regional uh initiatives of uh, interaction between an urban planner and town planner and the architecture and design community um, uh, with the, the bureaucratic setup of, of how the development and urban development can happen in uh, in, in such a large country uh, has literally gone out of the I, I, today when i hear about town planner i just say who you know yeah. <laughs> so, but amit but amit you know i think that's precisely the legacy that sora was talking about and that's why chandigarh is so important because yeah, within yeah. the bureaucracy that absolutism and that one imagination which is either the modern city and by extension the smart city sits there in fact that creates a wall between the architect and uh, the planner uh, the bureaucracy, because this imagination actually gets the it, it gets the most traction within the bureaucracy. 
I mean, one thing we did notice, because the way we structured our case study was starting with Chandigarh moving into steel towns, which was a different way of articulating who the worker is or who is the legitimate worker in the city uh, when you plan for your steel township employees moving even up to Navi Mumbai, where we see at least a kind of attempt at what it means to design a city for different levels of income. So we started to see the artist village, but we also saw very good examples of sites and service schemes where you had a mix of towers and literally serviced plots on which people could build on top of this idea that incremental incrementalism is a feature of the the architectural armature and and the point is that people can afford it at a starting point and keep growing over time and this is exactly how uh, low-income households in cities evolve it's something that slum rehabilitation housing never considers it's something that's almost only possible in a dense low-rise uh, typology but we actually then saw a complete retreat from that with liberalization and we feature Gurgaon for a bit just to talk about what the new paradigm of planning is non-planning in the sense that you just leave the playground open for developers to build their own infrastructures and things happen haphazardly outside of those enclaves. So we saw a complete retreat from even refining on the typologies of sites and services, which has completely retreated. I haven't seen any scheme yeah. of that sort repeated since then. And in fact, we now read about the World Bank revisiting those sites and seeing that what they considered a planning failure because they were evaluating within just a five to 10 year time frame instead of a 20, 30 year time frame, which is what cities need. They actually realized that these are thriving mixed income neighborhoods where people have taken complete ownership of the spaces. And, uh, you know, it's an example that somehow they unfortunately did not uh, promote and we don't actually see a contemporary version of that which has only gotten more complex because sites and services are about ownership and we are seeing the need for more types of rental housing more types of temporary housing which are not even year-long leases based on the fluidity of the labor market one of my main question was about this connection that uh, between the agrarian um, territories and the urban territories uh, and the maps that are generated to kind of show this condition, I, I think that's, at least that's how I read it, the, the connection between the two is called a condition. So how does that manifest, and maybe it's a slightly uh, academic question, but how does one communicate that? How does one communicate that idea beyond the book or beyond text? The communication is a challenge, and that's why when he told you we had to cut down things, we were looking at interactive projections on models, because essentially what we are dealing with is a notion of flux uh, and movement uh, and uncertainty. Uh, and it's very hard to capture that because there's an ephemerality to it and all of that. And we are yet working on it. We are committed to actually bringing this exhibition to India later in the year or early next year, uh, and then maybe expanding on the film, expanding on some of these interactive things. I don't know. So it's an ongoing project. But I think the more important thing to do is to understand what the agrarian field means. Uh, and therefore, then you realize how the communication of it uh, is a challenge. So the main premise of us trying to articulate this concept of the urban agrarian field as a lens to view India's territory is to really help people, including planners, understand that our cities are embedded within this densely populated agrarian landscape. And the way that our cities have grown and evolved uh, has to consider the fact that these cities are shaped by migrants who come from that territory to build the city, to grow the economy, to grow the informal economy. And that oftentimes they continue to have a very strong relationship back to the agrarian territory, to their villages. And that the city is then shaped by this constant flux of people moving back and forth. But also given the given the way you can look at the territory and see that there's a big city and another city and in between you have a whole continuum of settlements from small medium towns to large villages and what we are noticing in this era of what we could call post fordist industrialization you don't need factories in the heart of the city the the mill lands lost to mumbai 
uh, is lost in the sense that now you can do have big box industrial places, manufacturing places on the outskirts of cities that are within one hour from the airport. Uh, and so that's triggering new logics of urbanization. And that, that urbanization is triggering this densely populated feel that we never quite recognized within planning. So when we say that Chandigarh never planned for uh, low income construction workers is, is essentially planning, negating the fact that there will always be people from that field coming into your city because now your city is a kind of beacon for economic opportunity that simply hadn't existed in the territory before or that agriculture as an activity has become so economically weak that migration is a household strategy to compensate. Yeah. And so this linkage is something we want to create. It's an economic linkage, but it's also a very spatial linkage because the moment you start zooming out from Chandigarh, you begin to see this constellation of settlements that we highlight. But that's the case outside of Delhi, Mumbai, Kolkata, the entire indo plain, all of Kerala, outside of Chennai. So almost a huge part of India has to basically negotiate with this as a spatial condition and also an economic condition. And we simply haven't thought about architectural or planning approaches to, to address that. Yeah. And the pointed, the pointed implication of that, which Saurav has elaborated, is actually related to Amit's question about the bureaucracy, the town planner, and the architect, right? Because I think the fundamental question here becomes what is what what are what is it? What are the what is the boundary of governance for a city? And I think what Saurav has just said to us is that it's actually irrelevant because people come through that boundary. That is a completely porous cell, which means uh, whoever's governing it has no control on that flux. And therefore, uh, how we even also, you know, from cities, we move to metropolitan regions. That's a good move already because the metropolitan region is also where many things happen and you can create networks and ecologies that look at that. But it actually, in terms of scale, is even beyond that. And and therefore, actually, governance uh, has to fundamentally change in ways even authorities are networked and communicating with each other, right? When I uh, look at the study, it's, it may not be, I think, uh, solution-oriented at this point, but I see a very real part of uh, the Indian population being uh, affected by it in real time. That's what I think... Uh, uh, the study also and the COVID scenario and the, 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 you know, the tragic implications of the migrants being sent back to or, or walking to their cities, uh, that brought to light a, a, a sort of very different uh, plight. So as Rahul was talking about earlier, that there may be a sort of transience or an impermanence that we, we may be looking at, you know, uh, like an example that you gave uh, that I found very apt was bringing back the Dharamshala model maybe uh, that could operate on the fringes of the cities. So that there could be, you know, uh, social networking places for the migrant population. So I would like you to, you know, sort of delve on that idea a little between you and sort of both. Are we looking at a, a sort of a new hybrid uh, architecture or new sort of adaptive residential typology? Like maybe at one point the Chols sort of came into being in, in Bombay. So Anmol, I think that's a very good question. Let me just start by picking up on what you said in passing, uh, which was this is not a solution oriented proposition, correct? Uh, and I think let's just pick up and unpack that a little bit, because I think what you said is absolutely correct. But uh, the way I would um, uh, maybe explain that is I think the solution we are offering is the solution of looking at the process differently. Uh, we, if we start doing solutions, then we'll go back to absolutism because then we'll come up with the magic bullet, right? I think what we are arguing is that for each one of these urban centers, as you zoom out at different scales, you see different networks, you see it's situated within agrarian field, you see the fluxes that would occur in the way that settlement um, is, is impacted would be very different. So it's, it's really the solution here is recognizing the process. Uh, and then once you do that, many solutions open up. Right? You can think of typologies that are different. So I would not even, yes, so there could be typologies that are pure. There could be typologies that are incredible hybrids. You know, In places, maybe the solution of using the Chandigarh armature as a solution would be the right solution. In other places, you know, going for more incremental growth, using other forms of 
other logics to organize a settlement because you know you can use the logic of circulation uh, to organize the settlement which is a road system a grid right you can use the logic of uh, how natural systems operate within a terrain to organize the form of the settlement that's quite different and that would be real. so what you would apply in the decentralized uh, water land relationship of kerala uh, as a settlement pattern would be quite different from the hinterland of the indo-gangetic plain but the important thing here is recognizing the solution would come about from seeing the process in this nuanced way i think that is the critical mm-hmm. sort of yeah one thing we did want to it's not explicitly written in the book but the idea is that uh, the planner can never be all knowing and that this planner can never be the smartest person in the room to know how the city's needs are going to grow over the next 20 years yet some of the planning tools that we utilize make that assumption that planners and people who do land use planning and zoning know exactly how best to grow the city and also for whom and because we as long as, as we use these kind of dumb tools of planning it really doesn't matter what technology we use to make our observations we are still falling back on very archaic ways of doing things like land use planning so in some ways what we found in one of the studies was if you so compare a land use plan versus how a neighborhood actually evolved because they weren't able to enforce the land use plan you saw a much higher ratio of commercial entities within a residential uh, area than was originally planned so basically the way the neighborhood actually evolved created more jobs created more opportunities had more informal settlements therefore it had more social housing than was originally planned and as a result it's a better functioning neighborhood by all metrics but if we followed very archaic tools of doing land use plans every 20 years very specifically specifying what happens where when which is an impossible task to do yet we kind of burden our cities with the task of doing that uh, we are suggesting that maybe it's more politically expedient strategically expedient to really think of a strong resilient armature that ensures people the rights to all the essential amenities and also the the social institutions that enable all sections of the population to access that armature including people who have a very temporal relationship with the city and these typologies and approaches are 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 missing in our discourse um and also by expanding the scope we are talking about how planners can play a role beyond architecture and design because if you talk about the urban agree and flux and looking at how uh, people move across villages to cities a smart city intervention is a uh, you know a universal card that allows someone from the village to access their rations also in a city that they migrated to and it's not an architectural solution but it definitely is a smart solution for urbanization so when we use the covid footage what we are basically showing is the type of large scale migration that takes place over a course of a year we essentially saw happen in the form of an exodus uh, within a few hours and a few days but we also saw the precariousness of uh, migrant workers in the city so much so that a few days of not having their daily wages Uh, forces them to leave the city or that they continue to find more security moving back to the village than in the city and that kind of shows both the precariousness of migrant lives but also the immense scale of migrant workers so covid yeah. really exposed that in a way that we couldn't through any visualization we literally saw it happening and and so and one must... just very quick inter interjection when sort of talks about the dump of planning tools you know the one big uh, one is just what are standards right uh, what are the standards for the right density what is the standards for the right mix this gets universalized and this can't be universalized because these are cultural social economic topographical geographic resource based questions right uh, and so anmol i think if one actually accepts that opening up and if one devolves the planning even the planning norms standards what is adequate inadequate approaches the tools uh the, the temporal scales one works with more regionally and more locally uh, then architecture will naturally respond to that in a completely different way uh, 
I did have a question about some of the definitions, if we could, you know, uh, tie up our conversation with that. Uh, some that really did catch uh, my eye was, uh, you know, transitioning settlements, conditions, it, the terminology used um, throughout the research. That combined with the fact that the research obviously started before 2020, right? Uh, and in 2020, and as um, footage from the film, uh, you, which is being shown, also shows the, in some ways, the holes that always existed. How did some of the terminology change um, in the year between, uh, or the year that didn't happen, as many people keep saying? Um, well, actually, the terminology didn't change very much. It just was reinforced, and we proved that the terminology uh, actually was very valid. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I think the only terminology that might stand out are two, and I'll explain one and then hand it over to uh, uh, Saurav. One is transitioning settlements, which I'll let Saurav explain. And the other that we kind of use are the question of flux, which we've already explained is this movement of people. And I think the underlying kind of thesis in the project is that uh, what one can learn from looking at this kind of flux is uh, that uh, you know, we, we tend to, as planners, the tools we're given, the political imaginations, how politic, how imaginaries get stuck in bureaucracies for decades, uh, we get stuck with very absolute solutions that we can solve a problem. You know, even just the fact that the, uh, the Pradhan Mantri Ayojan says we are going to have so many million apartments done by so-and-so date and, you know, your back of the thumb, back of the envelope calculation will take you, tell you it will take about 100 years to do is the wrong way to do it because we have to relook at public private partnerships in different and more dynamic ways right so i think we're breaking away or we're trying to make the argument to break away from absolutism and think about how we make transitions where there's uncertainty in terms of these temporal scales etc and so the transition settlements is a definition that's very critical to all of this which i'll let uh, uh, saurav explain Yeah, so we began the research, as we mentioned, by really trying to deconstruct what the government even considers urban, because only the settlements that qualify as a statutory town or a census town is looked under the rubric of the Ministry of Urban Development or under urban development policy. And firstly, by doing that, what we are doing is looking at the three criteria that settlements have to meet to qualify as urban. And one by one, we kind of deconstructed each criteria. It is also something that has been done by IIHS, uh, but we kind of use that mapping to open up the dialogue that if you look at each criteria, uh, uh, more, more settlements in India, about 30,000 have more than 5,000 people, only 7,000 are considered towns, more than 70% of India live within densities that are considered urban, but they're not within urban settlements. Um, and that the main criteria that divides the two is economic activity. That, that is how many male main workers work in outside of agriculture uh, for more than six months a year. And that is quite a dynamic metric, but it's not measured in a dynamic way. It's so in a way, it's a somewhat of a flawed metric that's used as a cutoff uh, because that's the most limiting criteria for settlements. It's not population, it's not density. So what we are saying within the urban agrarian field is there is a huge amount of highly populated dense settlements that we never consider urban, but are in very close proximity to these urban centers. So when we try to then define what a transitioning settlement is, we are trying to identify a typology of settlements using proxies that we know are urbanizing. They may not be cities today, but they're definitely large villages where more people work outside of agriculture than they don't. Uh, within that transitioning settlement, we also club in census towns because census towns are places that have met all three criteria of the census, but their state governments have not created an urban local body for them. So in that sense, they are demographically, characteristically in some ways urban, but not administered by them. They're administered by panchayats. Uh, the second, the third typology we club in are just small towns that only recently established municipalities, but are less than 50,000 people. And we kind of use these metrics just to create a threshold, an alternative threshold that highlights about 10,000 plus settlements across India. And the geographic dispersion of those settlements also suggests an emergence of urbanizing corridors. It suggests 
the urbanizations of uh, peri-urban metropolitan areas, but also you see very disconnected places all across India opening up and urbanizing, which suggests that there is a different territorial organization or a potential for that that doesn't just depend on people within the agrarian field migrating to the large cities that we might be able to create more localized sites of opportunity. But they also present a, an urban planning challenge because none of these settlements are growing the way we expect traditional cities to grow. They're not growing from a colonial planning foundation. They have definitely never had municipal development plans. They're also infrastructurally dependent on networks that are not piped water, piped sewage. We might have to think about other decentralized ways of managing those infrastructures. And this typology of settlements that we think might house a significant percentage of the new urban population. It currently houses about 18% of the country's population. Uh, we are not even discussing what the future of those places could look like um, and what the planning profession could do about that. Uh, and then when you start looking at even medium towns that perpetuate that logic, or you look at mega cities that because they never accounted for the urban agrarian field have resulted in urban villages and informal settlements within it, uh, the argument that most people, the future urban population will be living in settlements like the ones that we are highlighting is quite likely. We can't empirically prove it at this point, but we are doing our best using proxies. But I think it's worth flagging as a field of study to really understand whether indeed most urban Indian populations, especially the future ones, will be happening in greenfield master plan cities or in the kind of places that we are highlighting that are low rise, self built, organic with very decentralized systems of infrastructure and we are not preparing either students or planning practitioners or even policy makers around that reality and thus becoming urban is the provocation to look at all of that yeah